Today part is part two of this financial series entitled Unlocking Abundance. And in this series, I'm, I'm wanting to teach you guys some principles, um, some biblical principles to help you understand God's perspective when it comes to the issue of finances. Um, you may not realize it, um, and this is something that I've heard people say, and, and this is obviously what people think, that the Bible doesn't, isn't really relevant for today. But you, probably what you don't realize is that um, out of all the topics that you find in the Bible, money is the most talked about topic. Two thirds of Jesus this, uh, parables or about finances. The Bible talks over and over and over and over again about finances. The Bible is incredibly relevant <laughs> for today. So this is why we want to do this series. And I also want to say this. I recognize and I understand the stigma. There's the word I was looking for. Mm -hmm. I recognize the stigma when the when finances are talked about in the church. I also recognize the hypocrisy of the stigma when it can be talked about anywhere else but for some reason it's not supposed to be talked about in this three foot block <laughs> but if you know me you know I don't care about all that Amen. what I what I do care about is you and I want you to be blessed. I want every single one of you to be blessed. So, no matter how difficult it may get today, hang in there with me. Because when it's all said and done, you're gonna go, wow. That's right. Wow. Mm -hmm. But you gotta hang in there. Amen? Amen. Amen. Promise, can we, can we promise. I promise, I promise not to hit too hard. If you promise to hang in there with me. Alright? Alright, I promise you it's gonna be good. This is gonna be good. Alright. You made a good decision. So let's do a quick review of part one, if you weren't here. And uh if, if you want to go back and see part one of the series that started, um, you can go to our YouTube channel. It's on there. So part one, that message was entitled, Don't Touch My Cookies. <laughs> Don't Touch My Cookies. I, I, got, I, got, I got like fan mail about that. <laughs> It's funny, you know, I was like, they love that title. You, you go on the internet and you're like, don't touch my cookies, I gotta watch this. <laughs> and it was on the principle of giving. The principle of giving. There were three things, three principles that I shared in that first message. The first one was that giving is giving. It, you know, a definition of giving. Giving is completely relinquishing control of something into the con control of someone else so that they can do whatever they please. So it's not alone, it's not, there's no, there's no um, agenda, um, there, there's nothing attached to it. When you give, you give. Number two was that giving is essential to being a Christian. If you are a Christian, you give. That's right. 
You can't separate the two. In fact, the word Christian actually started in Acts chapter 11 in the, in the Greek church in the city of Antioch. And the word Christian actually didn't start in with the people in the church. It was a word that secular people used to describe the people that were in the church. Christian means Christ ones or little Christ. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a name that secular people gave to people in the church because they looked like, they talked like, they acted like Jesus. Amen. And what was Jesus known for? Giving. He was known for giving. People out in the world were like, you must be a, one of those Christians because they were generous, they were loving, they looked like, they acted like, they were imitators of Jesus. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to be an imitator of Jesus and and Jesus was known for giving so giving is essential to being a Christian number three giving is an attitude before it's an action it's an attitude before it's an action the Holy Spirit is a generous giving person and if we're filled with the Spirit then we will be generous giving people. Yes. God, the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. That's an attitude. Mm -hmm. That's an attitude before it's an action. So giving should be a cheerful celebration. When we give, it should be like a party mm -hmm. happening. We should be celebrating. We should be high-fiving each other. Yes, right. When we give the offering, we should be high-fiving each other. <laughs> true. Yeah. All right. So those were the three things, the three main things that we talked about in part one. There was some other stuff, too. Don't have time to get into it. Um, but go to the YouTube channel and check it out. It, 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 it's, it's good. There, there's insightful stuff there that I want you to, to get. Today, <laughs> today's message, you're going to love this, is entitled, Too Legit to Quit, My Ode to MC Hammer. Too legit. I even wore the shoes. Too legit. Too legit to quit. All right. I want to start with a, with a, a story. Um, a man by the name of uh, John Templeton, he was actually Sir John Templeton, was a multi-billionaire. He's one of the wealthiest men in the world. And uh, he passed away in 2008. John Templeton was a dedicated Christian. And when he was in his 90s, he was interviewed <coughs> Uh, for some magazine and uh, John Templeton invented trust funds the idea of trust funds for investments hmm. he started the Templeton fund that if you if you know anything about investing you know the Templeton fund he invented that one of the wealthiest men in the world so in this, this interview, when he was in his 90s, they asked him, how did you make such enormous wealth? I've got your attention right now, I can tell. I can see the look on your face. Like, how did you, Sir John Templeton, how did you do this? How did you do it? He said, from the very start, I did the 10, 10, 80 rule. 10% goes to God. 10% goes to savings. And I lived off the rest. 
10 10 80. Yeah. He gave a principle. Yeah. He lived by this principle. Mm -hmm. 10 10 80. Isn't it interesting that the first 10 yeah. went to God? That's it. Why? Because he's first. Why 10% to God? Why would John Templeton, who was born in 1912, base his life on a principle that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve's family. Why would he born in 1912? I would I would say he this was the New Testament time period. <clears throat> Why would he base his life on a principle that dated all the way, literally all the way back to the family of Adam and Eve? Mm -hmm. To understand this, you have to understand the definition of the word tithe. You have to understand the definition. Here's the definition of the tithe. Tithe means tenth. And tithe is the portion that God says we are to give back to him of what we receive from him. Yes. You can take a picture of it or you can write it down. <laughs> this is the definition of the tithe. It means tenth. The portion that God says we are to give back to him of what we receive from him. Now, this is obviously a difficult thing for some people. Obviously. A difficult thing for people to do in this modern time because most People who profess to be Christians today don't do it. That's right. Sorry. Mm -hmm. It's a fact. Most, the majority of people today who claim to be Christians don't do this. There was, years ago, a man by the name of Peter Marshall was the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. Uh, he was a pastor, a uh, doctor. A man came to him and with a problem, a concern he had about, about tithing. And he said, um, Dr. Marshall, I have, a, I have a problem. He said, I've been tithing for many, many years. And he said, it wasn't too bad when I was only making $20,000 a year. I could afford to give up $2,000 a year. He said, but now I'm making $500,000 a year and I can't afford to give $50,000 a year. I can't afford it. I have, a, I have a problem. What do you think I should do? Pastor Marshall reflected on it. Didn't give any advice. He, he said, he just said, yes, sir, I can see. You do have a problem. He said, I'd like to pray 
for you for your for this problem would it, would that be okay and the man said yes that would be that would be great thank you so dr marshall bowed his head and he said dear lord this man has a problem and i pray that you will help him please reduce his salary back <laughs> To where he can afford to tie. It's obviously a difficult thing for people to do because most don't. The average church attending Christian in, in America gives less than 3% of their income. And that number was before the pandemic. That number is less than that today. Here's some perspective. If every Christian in America were to lose their jobs and went on welfare, so think of it, every single Christian in America lost their job and went on welfare, and if they actually tithe from their welfare check, giving in U.S. churches would increase by over 30%. Oh my yes. It's obviously a difficult thing. And it might be a difficult thing for you. So in order to get into this teaching, you can't teach on tithing without dealing with the ownership issue. Mm -hmm. The ownership issue. Because we forget that God owns everything. Mm -hmm. God owns everything. Look at what God says in Psalm 50, starting verse 7. He says, He's speaking to Israel. He says, listen, my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. I am God, your God. I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifices or concerning your burnt offerings, which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens for every Every animal of the forest is mine. <clears throat> and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains. And the insects in the fields are mine. Mm, yes. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine. And all that is in it. God owns everything. God owns everything. We own nothing. <laughs> it's kind of like when you take your if you take your five year old, whether it's a grandkid or your kid, you take your five year old to McDonald's and you buy him a happy meal. And, and you're sitting there just enjoying your time with your, with your five-year-old and you reach over and grab one of the french fries and they smack you on the head and you go, no, that's mine, that's mine. And in, in your mind, they're just flashing and you go, hold up. The clothes you're wearing, I bought them. The car we drove in to get here, I bought it. Those french fries, I paid for. Them. And you're going to smack my hand and tell me that they're yours? That's how we are with God. He owns everything. He lets us use his stuff. Thank you, Jesus. We get to use God's stuff. That's right. And if God 
Let's follow the train of logic. If God owns everything, then the tithe belongs to God. It belongs to him. In Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, Moses is teaching the people of Israel, and he says this, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. So in this right here, Moses is teaching the people of Israel about stewardship because that's what this is all about. God owns everything. He lets us use it. We become stewards of everything that God owns. So Moses is teaching the people of Israel about the principle of stewardship. Now, I want you to think about this. Moses is teaching people who have been slaves. Israel were slaves for 400 years. 400 years. Think of, you know, your, your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your great-great-grandparents, and it goes, oh, all you've ever known is slavery. Slaves don't own anything. Right. Slaves don't, you don't even own yourself when you're a slave. So Moses is speaking to people. He's trying to teach them the, this principle of stewardship. These people have never owned anything. And now they're about to go into the promised land. And now they're going to have how they're going to own houses. They're going to own farms. They're going to be business people. They're going to they're have money. They've never had money. They're going to have stuff. And he's teaching them. Here's the way you need to handle this. From now on, you need to understand the principle of stewardship. But the question, would they, when they start getting stuff, would they acknowledge the one who gave it to them? Or would they just think, hey, I did this myself. This is mine. This is mine. Those fries are mine. The tithe belongs to the Lord. In other words, and, and maybe this might, it might help make it easier, it never belonged to you in the first place. <laughs> So I want to give you three things to understand about the tithe. Two things I'm just going to kind of blast through real fast. But the third thing, this is the thing I want you to really hang in there with me. Number one, three things to understand. Number one, the tithe accounted for all increase. The tithe accounts for all increase. Now at that time when Moses was, was speaking to the people in teaching them in Leviticus, um, People were farmers or ranchers. So when harvest time came, they gave the Lord a tenth of what they harvested, a tenth of their increase. Most of us, maybe probably all of us, are not farmers or ranchers. For us, harvest time comes twice a month. Right? Right. When your check comes, when when that deposit drops, right. when that envelope gets handed to you with the cash, that's harvest time. The tithe accounts for all increase. Number two, the tithe is considered holy to God. Now this is important. This goes back to what we saw um, in Leviticus 27:30, Moses said, "A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord." 
The word holy in the Bible has multiple meanings. And it can be confusing sometimes. But here in Leviticus 27.30, the word holy means separate from the ordinary. Since the tithe is separate from the ordinary. So, here's what this means. God has tagged yeah. a tenth of everything he gives to you. God has tagged a tenth of that for special purposes that he has. Mm, that's good. There's something God wants to do, something special that he wants to do. It's designated for him so that he can do something special with that tent that he gives you. And when you give it back to him, he's then able to do whatever he, special or separate thing that he was planning on doing. That tent. could save someone's life. Yeah. That tent can, can change something in the world yeah. because it's something that God has already decided this is what I'm going to do with that. It's sacred. Mm -hmm. It's special. It's separate from the ordinary God wants to do something with it. Amen. That's, That's why it's holy. Really Number three. The tithing is an act of worship. Tithing is an act of worship. Maybe one of the best ways to illustrate this is to look at the story in the Old Testament of Jacob. Of Jacob. So what I, I want to I want to kind of go through this story and and uh, there's some things in it especially that I think are so important and so helpful uh, for us. So we're going to start at Genesis chapter 28, and I, I encourage you. This week, if you get a chance to, to you know, maybe start in, in Genesis 28 and read through and read about, you can actually start before that, and, and read about the story of Jacob. It's really, really very interesting. So we're going to start in Genesis 28, starting in verse 10. It says, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. All peoples on the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Thank you, God. So Jacob is on this, he's traveling, spends the night, has this dream, gets this amazing promise from God, sees this vision, and, has, and, and here, here is this promise from God about his life. And here's what I want you to see. Up until this point in Jacob's life, 
There is no indication that Jacob is living for God. Right. He was not living for God. He was not a good person. <laughs> In fact, all of his life, Jacob had been a schemer. Right. He had been a con man. Mm -hmm. He was a deceiver. His name, Jacob, means one who deceives. Oh, he came out of the womb as a deceiver. That's why he got that name. He, was, he has always been able to rely on his ability to outsmart people to get what he wanted. And in fact, earlier, he had deceived his own father to give him his twin brother's blessing. So he stooped as low as taking advantage of his own family. And now, it's so interesting, it says Jacob left Beersheba. No, what he did was he was on the run. <laughs> Because his, his brother found out what he did and his brother was going to kill him. Yeah. So he had to get out of town fast and go far away. Context is important, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. That's the context of him being on the run, probably exhausted, and probably looking behind him the whole time, hoping that he didn't see a dust trail of horses coming his way, you know, to, to hunt him down. Finally, lays down and goes to sleep and has this amazing encounter with God. Because God, even though he lived that way, God had a plan for his life. So God speaks to him in a dream and gives him a promise. Let's read on, verse, starting in verse 16. It says, When Jacob awoke, awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Yep. He says, he wakes up and he goes, this is the house of God. That word Bethel means house of God. This is the house of God. In his mind, he, he stumbled, he had stumbled upon the literal gateway to heaven. Wow. The stairway to heaven. And you thought Led Zeppelin was original. <laughs> Pays to read your Bible, doesn't it? <laughs> he literally thought he had stumbled upon the, the access point. This is the, this is the access point to God. And so to commemorate the event, he sets up a pillar of stones, probably high enough to be able to, to get on his knees and, and be able to pray is an altar. You created an altar of rocks. 
And then he poured out a drink offering on top of the rocks and made a vow. In his mind, this was his way. And I, hear, I need you to pay attention to this. This, what he did when he built that altar, poured the oil on it, and made a vow, was his way of dedicating his life to God. That's right. He was dedicating himself to God. From now on, I'm going to put my trust in you. For, for us, it would be the same as praying the prayer of salvation. Yes. I'm dedicating myself to God. Mm -hmm. The vow that he made. He says in verse 20, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. Here's the part that's interesting. That word if in the Hebrew is also interpreted as the word since or surely. Surely God will be with me. Surely God will be with me and surely he will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and surely he will give me food to eat and surely he will give me clothes to wear. And surely he will make sure that I return safely. In, in other words, God, you're promising to provide, protect, and guide my life. Yes. And, and in return, I'm going to, to worship you. And part of my worship will be, I will give you a tenth. Yes. This vow is actually the first vow that's recorded in the Bible. Jacob is acknowledging that God is the one who will guide him, who will provide for him, and who will protect him. He doesn't have to figure it out on his own. He doesn't have to work it. He doesn't have to outsmart people. All he has to do is depend on God That's good. Mm -hmm. who will guide, feed, protect, provide for him. Mm -hmm. So out of a heart of thanksgiving, he promises to give a tithe mm -hmm. to God. Listen, the tithe is not about rules. It's not about rules. The tithe is about a relationship with God. Yes. The one who loves you. The one who provides for you. Yes. The one who protects you. The one who guides and directs your life. When Jacob, the schemer, got to meet God for the first time. Because yeah. that's what happened that night. Who knows in his mind, you know, he probably never even really thought about God before. He was busy doing his own thing. But that night, he met God. And when he met God and saw who God was really, what God was really like, he was blown away. Yeah. So much so that he was like, I'll give you whatever. I'm, I'm with you, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. I'm dedicating my life. The act of, in the Bible, the act of pouring out mm -hmm. 
is an offering. Mm -hmm. He was pouring himself out to God. I'm giving you my life. When Jacob got to meet God and found out for himself what God was really like, he was convinced enough to put his life in God's hands. Yeah. Are you convinced to put your life in God's hands? And one of his expressions of faith and love would be to give God a tenth. Now I wish the story ended there. Because in reality, Jacob was still a schemer. He didn't keep his vow. He didn't keep that vow with God. Over the years, he drifted farther and farther away from God and from his vow. But God showed him how to get back to that. God showed him, and this happens in, in uh, chapter 35. So from 28, chapter 28, all the way up until chapter 35, we see the drift. And it's a picture of what happens with us. We can drift. Maybe you have drifted. But God showed him how to get back to Bethel. It's a good thing for us to have a Bethel in our lives, a place where we go back to, where things started, when we first met God and made, made the commitment. In, in, in chapter 35, God tells Jacob, go back to Bethel. And when he goes back, literally to the same place, found that altar that he made, he has another encounter with God. Mm -hmm. And God speaks the same promise to him. Mm -hmm. But this time it was different. This time Jacob was different. Mm -hmm. Now he knew he was truly convinced. Now he was changed. And he truly trusted God. And God changed his name. This is when you know you're changed when God changes your name. Mm -hmm. And God changed his name from Jacob, one who deceives. God changed his name to Israel. To Israel. We all drift. We all struggle with trusting God. You're not, you're not alone. We all struggle with trusting God. And money is often the way that God shows us yes. that, we, that we're struggling with trusting him. Mm -hmm. God wants you to get back. Go back. Go back to your Bethel. Mm -hmm. Because God's promises to guide you, provide for you, and protect you. His promises are too legit to quit. <laughs> His promises to provide, God protect, are too legit to quit. So no matter where you're at, 
you can always go back to dedicating yourself to him. The question as we close, have you dedicated yourself to God? I want to encourage all of you that are watching to continue to give faithfully to Celebration Church. There's so many different ways that you can do that. Of course, you can mail, mail, uh, mail it in or drop by our location, which is 990 Meadowgate Road in Meta Vista, uh, California, 95722. You can give online a couple of different ways. You, know, you can always use PayPal. And use the PayPal address of one celebration at sbcglobal.net. Or you can go to our, our website, our church website, which is www.ccfellowship.org. Go to the home page, go up to the About Us uh, tab, pull that down and go to the to Give Now and then there's a donate button that will take you to our online giving page. And uh, text giving is available as well. That's our, it's probably the fastest way to give to our church. And that is you text the word give, text the word give to area code 530-288. 4,500, and you can uh, give your tithe and offering uh, to, to Celebration that way as well. And uh, always, if you're watching on our YouTube channel at Celebration Church Office, subscribe and click like. We are so glad you decided to join us today. We hope you were blessed and encouraged. If you gave your life to Christ or want to reach out to us in any way, us at celebrationchurch13 at gmail.com. To purchase Lou Ann Lee worship CDs and songbooks, click the links below. God bless you.